humanity starts right here, right now. Tonight, a shocking report as officials claim the co-pilot of the doomed German Wings flight crashed the plane on purpose. Our aviation experts are here tonight to analyze. Joining me now with more reaction is aviation expert attorney Brian Claypool, as well as aviation attorney Sal Lagonia is with us. Sal, a lot of this doesn't make sense. Now, I, I look at the, the A320 and, and in post 9-11 world, and they have all the controls. You could actually drop a grenade and you're not going to be able to open that door. Here's what I want to know. Did, do you suspect, as the prosecutor does, that he did this consciously? He drove this airplane into this mountain? I, I think in one way or another, most of us on Tuesday were thinking that. There's not too many natural ways that an airplane does what this airplane did. Um, he had to actually keep the, the pilot outside of the, the uh, cockpit door by, by holding down a button that overrides the, 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 the code. code pad. Right. Uh, and he had to reprogram the, the FMS, which is the well, flight let management me, system. Let me explain this, because there are th literally three buttons, unlock, normal, and lock. Correct. He had to literally put it in the, in the lock position. In the override position override, to override that, that code. That, that pilot from trying to get in. Okay, that so that means the pilot otherwise would have been able to get in. Nor do I think the co-pilot on his own would descend in what is a gradual descent, right? Not, certainly not or at that stage descent. in the flight. That stage in the flight, they were at cruise. They were at 38,000. They were expected to stay there. Yeah. The next thing we know, the flight management system is being reprogrammed to start the descent all the way down to the surface. Yeah. Brian, do, uh, do you agree with that? It seems to me that there's too many. Yeah. Uh, the plane didn't descend. It didn't make this descent on its own. Obviously, the yeah, co-pilot sure. made that decision. Yeah. They heard him breathing, but that doesn't prove that he's conscious, right? Well, it doesn't, but I agree, though, that this was, it was a deliberate act. He was breathing normally. He was making a conscious effort to stop the pilot from entering into the cockpit. So I think, and, and the descent was a, it was a normal, it was semi-rapid, but it was a pretty much normal descent. And I think that's an important It was a normal fact, controlled too. descent, to, right? That right, exactly, and I think that supports the proposition that this was a deliberate act. Yeah, what do you think? I absolutely agree. It was a, it was a normal descent. It was a normal descent at the same airspeed, a consistent airspeed. Look at his airspeed at the top of the descent and at the bottom. You typically would speed up as you go downhill in a car. Right. Well, it didn't happen here. His right. his airspeed was 442 knots all right. the way through. So he probably switched the altitude number. He wanted he switched to. The altitude so he knew where number. he was going. He told the FMS, keep me at this speed so the airplane doesn't fall yeah. apart. Unbelievable. All yeah. right. So now I guess the next question is, why are they so slow in giving out the information? Well, you have to remember, in, in Europe, Europe, they treat this as a criminal offense right from the get-go. In the United States, we treat it as a civil defense, uh, offense. So now that it's truly a criminal offense, they're going to be a little bit slower with their information. And, and Brian, I know that a lot of airlines, starting Norwegian Airlines, Canadian Airlines, and, and others, have now have adopted rules that we have in America. That is that you have to have two people in the cockpit at all times. So if a, one of the pilots leaves, somebody else goes in his place, right? Well, yeah, I, I think that's true, and I think one of the bigger... Uh, issues that I think is coming out of this tragedy, Sean, is to what extent are airlines, not only in the U.S., but around the world, are vetting the pilots after they've been hired? Because I did a bit of research on this, too, and there isn't a lot of Federal Aviation Administration regulations in the U.S., for example, that, that regulate pilots once they've been hired. For example, are there any drug testing? Is there any type of mental health uh, checking after pilots have been hired? Are there any attempts at looking at you know, issues like depression here? Well, and, they, and, well here's and a I question. Some, should, should somebody that is a pilot, that if in their later years they somehow suffer from depression, anxiety, should they be taken out of that, that seat? Well, I, I, I think so. And I think a big issue here, Sean, is we, I, I think airlines have to take a close look at themselves. Because if you have a pilot that's putting, and you're putting a lot of lives into that pilot's hands, I think that pilot has to relinquish a certain degree of privacy. In other words, they have to be transparent about what's going on in their life. And I think yeah. airlines have to be vigilant in doing so. And right. I don't think we have right. that. Sal, we'll give you the last word. Well, I agree with that to some extent. However, they, the pilots do go through a physical every year, which does include drug tests and, and psychological such. testing. Not psychological testing, and that may That's, be where we're falling short. You know, in, in one sense, uh, they did such a good job after 9/11. They made these doors that nobody could get through, and in this case, yeah. the pilot wanted to get back in. All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it.